So a couple weeks ago, I came across this documentary that was put together by a channel called Lucid Truth. And uh, the name of the documentary is called The Strange Truth Project. Not a bad name. And the first hour and 50 minutes or so were absolutely phenomenal. I mean, he starts out from from just total square one, like for gearing it towards the person who's, you know, never done any research, possibly never even looked into any conspiracies or the fake moon landing or anything, and just works you through just from a very introductory level and very patiently goes through things like kind of his own story with uh, P900 observations and and all that. So just a fantastic job, like walking you through all the little, you know, the typical reactions and questions and objections and and everything. And it just works you into the whole realization of the earth actually being flat and there's no curvature and la da 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 da. So I was really digging it. And, and then suddenly at about almost two hours in, my heart sank because he just suddenly launches into this section talking about how uh, the AE map is disinformation and it doesn't work and so you know it's like truth mixed with lies and blah 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 and you know basically for the same reasons that we always hear uh, guys like FEA you know honking about in terms of the the declinations of the the sunrise and sunsets you know basically it has to do with just the the luminaries it's always you know, it's inevitable that people, they start to freak out and think that the AE map is, you know, is disinfo and is a psyop and made to look flat earth look stupid. It's because they get hung up on the luminaries, right? The angles of the sun, moon, and stars. And so there have been some good stuff coming out lately that has been refuting a lot of that. So I don't need to get into that whole rabbit trail. But the reason I'm talking about it is because he then chops to a rather painfully lengthy segment of these two dudes who are still, you know, pushing their alternative square wonky line curvy curvy equator simulation theory square map. And this is what a lot of people then gravitate towards because they're the the circular map, the AE map is a psyop, so there's got to be something else and then they also get on this bandwagon about you know, the, there's the four corners of the Earth, so there's four corners on here, even though, even though in reality there's not. But, um, you know, not to mention the fact that the Bible also talks about the circle of the Earth, and they've completely chucked that out the window. So they have no circle of the Earth, and they have they have an illusory co four corners of the Earth. They really don't, because if you really understand what they're describing here with this, it's basically like a Pac-Man map, this simulation theory map. You know, you go over one line, you pop out the other side. So really that corner is not, there's no corner there. You don't, you can't like fly your plane to the corner of the map and then it's just like the two walls converge and you can't go any farther. You can just go on endlessly. So it's basically like two walls that never end. You know, you're in this endless corridor, right? So there's no corners on this map. It's just, you're only, you're only taking a square sized chunk of what is an infinite Supposedly an infinite simulation in either direction, east west, and then and then claiming corners. And then Darren Nesbitt, and I like Darren Nesbitt. I don't want to pick on him, but he's kind of got caught up in that same logical fallacy. But the reason I'm even talking about this is not to debate maps per se, because I'm not I'm not defending that. I'm not putting all my money on the AE map or whatever. I it, to me it's like again, all those those are interesting conversations and. And all that but ultimately not the end-all be-all and if you know that there's no curvature if you know that nasa is fake if you know that you know they've lied about the cosmology they've lied you know to create the whole big bang scenario and you understand that the bible is true literally then you know arguing over exactly what shape antarctica it is and exactly you know trying to figure out the map is in my opinion an absolute just another trap to fall into and it's it's appealing to to your pride and hubris and it's just ultimately a, it's a waste of time in so many ways because you're never gonna you're never gonna be able to like actually go go up and get that bird's eye view of the whole thing only god has that so it's really yeah it's it's super tiresome
But what was really sad was that after the guys pushing the simulation theory map talked for 20 minutes, he then launches into this. Yes, this is a lot to take in and try to process. But again, if we're living inside a simulation, then everything you just watched could actually work. Because what about the miracles performed by Yahawashai, the Christ? Don't his miracles make more sense if you approach them as if he performed them inside a simulation? Like the walking on water? Or like the transformation of water into wine? Or like the miracle of the five loaves and two fish? And what about miracles in general, like the ones you've heard about or experienced around you personally? Like a person being strong enough to lift a vehicle off of someone else? Or what about someone surviving a skydiving accident without even a broken bone? Or what about cancer going away from one test to the next? There are so many things that happen that just can't be explained away based on the rules that we've been taught. Because what we're looking at right now are actually dew drops. It's water recorded in somebody's backyard. These look a lot like the stars in the sky that I've personally recorded. And what about the clouds? Science says that clouds are a large collection of tiny droplets of water, or ice crystals. They also say clouds are a mixture of gas, liquids, and solids. But I've sat in a lot of window seats on a lot of airplanes, and those planes have flown through countless clouds. But my plane's window never really got soaked unless it was raining. So do clouds really house tiny droplets of water or ice crystals and then release them when it's just simply time to rain? And another question is, what about lightning? What is it? What causes it? Science says that it happens whenever heavier, negatively charged particles sink to the bottom of clouds. And when the positive and negative charges grow large enough, a giant spark, called lightning, occurs between the two charges within those clouds. And what about the northern and southern lights? Science says they're polar lights, a natural phenomenon found in both the northern and southern hemispheres. Science says that they're created when charged particles from the sun strike atoms in Earth's atmosphere. And that causes electrons in the atoms to move to a higher energy state. And when the electrons drop back to a lower energy state, they release a photon, light. This process is what's supposed to create the beautiful aurora, or northern and southern lights. But I gotta ask, has mankind really figured all of this out, all the way down to an alleged particle, electron, atom, and photon level? Of course, I have a lot of questions, and there are a lot of things that I wonder. That's why I keep researching and looking for the truth. But right now, I'm experiencing Earth like never before with eyes wide open. Because I contend there's a lot that we don't know, but there's also a lot that we can research and discover through simple observations and more. Yes, we may be wrong about some stuff, but we may also be right about a lot of things. And as of now, based on everything that I've researched, I don't believe that we ever went to the moon because I don't believe there is an outer space in the way that we've been taught. So I don't believe that we can leave this earth. And I believe the earth is flat. And it seems we could be living inside a simulation. So I believe we're living during extremely interesting times. And in these times, I believe strange truths can be researched, discovered, and revealed like never before. And that right there is just such a tragic example, but a, you know, a perfect example of the same theological you know, ramifications and fruit of once you start introducing this simulation theory idea in order to try and deal with these perceived problems of the observations with the luminaries on a flat earth map, um, now you've just, you know, it's, it's another one of these Trojan horse type scenarios where you've just inadvertently allowed in a concept which I, I, that is a, a cult in nature that is being pushed by the same, all the same prophets of scientism that are pushing the globe and the Copernican theory and quantum physics and all that. I mean, Neil deGrasse Tyson and Michio Kaku and, you know, all these guys. In simulation theory is not something they scoff at at all, quite the opposite. And I've, you know, done many videos in the past demonstrating this, that they they aren't saying it's it's 100% true, but they... 
Neil deGrasse Tyson loves the idea that we're in a video game and uh, it's all just the creation of some six-year-old alien child playing in his parents' basement. So, yeah. so who made the simulation? Some, some, some snot-nosed <clears throat> kid in, in the parents' basement well, of an alien civilization well, who's mean, bored and, and they're more advanced than we are <clears throat> and they have way, way more computing power than we are. Right, so this so is like a little handheld Nintendo you can exactly. do. Exactly, and so they program in enough detail to completely simulate every molecule in this universe, and we are here for their entertainment. Enter the multiverse theory. Imagine an endless number of universes and an endless number of us. Universes where we can be playing Battlefield, The Sims, Dragon Age, and FIFA endlessly. Nice. And if you simulate something as precise as the original thing, I don't think actually there is a difference. Uh, this universe could have been created by some super intelligence in another universe. So, so maybe we're, the whole, our whole universe is a junior high school science experiment of some super intelligent junior high school student in another universe. And another possibility is that our, our universe actually runs on a computer because people have examined physical laws as a set of computational processes. And it's, it's really quite plausible to say our, our universe is a computer. Everything is code. Everything is code in the sense that hackers mean when they say they write code, a vocabulary with very uh, defined rules and quick to learn, and then they're like tinker toys. Once you know the rules of the connectivity, then you can sit down like a child and begin to stick these things together and say, well, what would this be like, and what would this be like, and does God allow this, or <laughs> does this break the rules, and so forth. So that is what is sort of ironic. I mean, it's beyond ironic. It's just, it's like I said, it's sad because they don't really fully understand the, the serious theological implications of what they are importing along with that, all that comes with that. And if you just start doing some simple Google or YouTube searches and start looking into simulation theory and quantum physics and quantum consciousness and all this stuff, I mean, the results are endless. And, you, you, and so many people, I think, then can start like absolutely are being led into all this new age deception that has been out there for years and years all over the internet because they get introduced to this idea through flat earth and enclosed cosmology and think that this holds the key to it starts out by just claiming to solve the issues with the luminaries but really then of course the problem with taking the simulation theory approach is that it, it isn't just limited to what's above and what we see in the heavens, it applies to everything, right? All of reality. And so then they start attributing this to things like Jesus' miracles. If you believe that Jesus was real and, and did miracles, as, uh, as I do and many people do, but then you start actually taking this hermetic approach, basically, to the Bible and to miracles and to God's power and authority over his creation. And it really kind of makes me think of two different uh, examples from scripture that I think speak to this issue. On the one hand, you have the centurion whose servant was sick and he was a, he was a, a righteous man, a godly man, and he heard about Jesus and his miracles and he sent a messenger to Jesus saying that, you know, I'm a man in, uh, of authority. You know, I have people under, under me and I, you know, I tell this one go and he goes, I tell this one come and he comes, you know, and all you have to do is say the word and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says that he'd never encountered such great faith in all of Israel. And he's talking about a Roman centurion. I mean, can you imagine how offended a lot of the Israelites, a lot of the, the, the Hebrews would have been hearing that when their, their own Messiah is praising a, you know, a heathen man, supposedly, you know, well, at least a, a non-Jew. But what does that verse tell? This is one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Um, but what is it really saying there? Why is Jesus commending that kind of faith? It's because the, cent the centurion didn't even really understand all the, the nitty gritty of the background of who Jesus was prophesied to be and the law. And probably there was his understanding of, of the whole Hebrew religious system was prob probably quite limited being a Roman, I would imagine. But basically he was acknowledging that Jesus had ultimate authority as God and as creator. 
he didn't claim to understand how that authority worked. He just knew all you got to do is say it and, you know, it's like no questions asked. Just like he was using his own life as an analogy. Like when I just, when I tell a soldier who's under my command, they don't have a choice. They just do it. There's no, maybe they'll, you know, maybe they'll have, maybe they'll obey, maybe they won't. They have to obey. That's how it works in, you know, in the military and in the, the Roman army. It's just what his word goes, right? It's absolute authority. You follow orders. And he was saying, he was using his own life as, as a military man to explain that he understood that Jesus had that kind of authority over all of creation and over disease and over, you know, everything without having to even understand exactly how or why that worked. And Jesus said it was the greatest example of faith in all of, he hadn't found, he hasn't found that great of faith in all of Israel. Now, if you contrast this to the story in Acts, where there was this individual named Simon the Sorcerer, who sees the apostles going around and they're doing miracles in the name of Jesus, and he comes to understand that there's this thing called the Holy Spirit, and he actually tries to buy the Holy Spirit from them. And he gets rebuked super harshly because he tried to, to buy the Holy Spirit. And to me, this verse actually is describing essentially the same mistake, the same error that countless people today are unknowingly falling into as well. And they're falling into the mindset of, of magic and of the occult and of sorcery, where, you know, where you see Simon the Sorcerer, he's, he thinks that the Holy Spirit is something to be acquired. It's a certain type of knowledge. It's a certain type of power that he can take and put it in his tool belt, put it in his toolbox, along with all of his other spells and all of his other magical understanding in order to be able to wield to that power himself. And this is the danger that really is at the heart of this whole debate. And this is why I keep, you know, I've taken such a firm stand against uh, things like the teachings of Anthony Patch and um, his ideas of the tetrahedron, you know, and his defending this idea of the world being made from tetrahedrons and, you know, geomancy is something that God understood and, and all these errors that are very subtle at times, but starting to like soften up to this idea of the power of God, the way that miracles work, the way that miraculous power worked had to do with God, you know, reorganizing things on a quantum level changing the quantum spin, changing the, the fractal, you know, organization of things on like its most basic elemental level, you know, and this is really why atomism goes back all the way to the Greeks and to, uh, you know, like to the, the era of the Vedas and, and ancient Indian mysticism, because it's this idea of, you know, at the, at the most basic construct level of the reality, things can be rearranged, the code can be rewritten, however you want to describe it. And that's how God does miracles, is that he's just rearranging the, the programming the way that a programmer, you know, re rearranges the, the code and the software to make it do what he wants. And that is a, a, such a dangerous, you know, the more you understand how prevalent this simulation theory is uh, in terms of its new age connotations, in terms of its occult, the way that this, this truly is the gateway into deeper occultism for countless people out there, the more I think you, you can really appreciate why this is like a, a line that has to be drawn and defended and refuted. And so I know for some people this might sound like, you know, I'm, I'm being kind of a broken record when it comes to simulation theory, but in some ways I feel like I could probably focus on it a lot more than I do you know, I could I could talk about nothing else and just devote my whole you know, channel to refuting simulation theory, and I'd probably never run out of examples to point to and things to talk about, and you know I could make that my whole emphasis, and maybe I should. I don't know. Maybe that's because it really does tie into the whole New Age deception. Um, it's inseparable, and so yeah, I don't think it's a very a difficult concept to to come to identify and, and discern once once you've been made aware of it. But it's something that um, I know more and more people are coming into this conversation or coming into Flat Earth or coming into all these kinds of conversations as they kind of learn, you know, as they start, quote unquote, waking up and learning about all the deceptions. And this is something that just gets 
inevitably thrown at people and this whole idea of like the power of intentions right we just saw uh, truth stream media came out with a, a video like a week ago talking about the rice experiment and it's all the same it's all the same stuff the power of positive thinking the power of you know basically the the, the conscious mind i mean this is all simulation theory really simulation theory is what inevitably people will then start to gravitate to gravitate towards in order to try and understand what they perceive to be is this truth of like your thoughts create reality and you know positive thoughts create positive reality and negative thoughts create negative reality and this is this is again this is nothing new this is all hermetic thinking and it goes back into things like the Kabbalion, which came out you know the beginning of the 20th century but it's just repackaged ancient occultism mysticism it's it's the same it is the same sinful mentality that Simon the Sorcerer was rebuked for um, all the way 2,000 years ago. You know, so like, nothing new under the sun. But we have to be able to recognize that and know how to rebuke it ourselves when these ideas start popping up in people. You know, whether they think of it as science or whether they think of it as you know metaphysics and quantum theory, you know, consciousness, you know, spirit science. It, the packaging can change the. You know the the flavor can can change, but it's it's the same thing at the end of the day. And um, you know we believe in a God who he created the world out of nothing. Uh, he didn't need to so you know, just to do that, he didn't use a system. He didn't use a code. He didn't he didn't operate according to certain cosmic laws in order to do that because he created all them all in the first place. Does that make sense? So understanding exactly how reality works and the creation where I there's so many parallels between in the cosmology issue and then these other you know reality issues and and it, you know it's, it's amazing how you can reject you, you can wake up to the fact that there's all this NASA deception and the globe deception and all this stuff and and all these these things of scientism and and scoff at Neil deGrasse Tyson and Bill Nye and all these guys but then fall into the same the same type of humanistic trap, the same pride, the same error, because uh, of thinking that we can figure it all out and that we just, you know, we, we want to have that knowledge for ourselves as opposed to just being able to stop and be in childlike wonder of all that God has made and and have that simple faith that the centurion had where he just, we, you know, he just knew that God would... <laughs> I don't know who you are or how it works, but I know that you have the ultimate authority over everything. And you, you know, God, God makes it work somehow. And that's the kind of faith that I feel like I'm constantly being brought, being reminded by God to, to come back to and to not try and figure it all out, to not try and put it all down into a, into models and formulas and theories and maps, but just let it be about the person of God and let it be about the gospel and that you know, regardless of how all the mechanics of the earth and the heavens work that's it's not the most important question for my life or for your life or for anyone that we might engage with it's you know where where do you put your faith where do you put your trust where do you put your hope do you know that God uh, loves you do you know that Jesus died for you do you know that do you know that God is is even real do you know that you know, he's there watching over your 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 life right now. He knows everything about you, and um, nothing in your life is is wasted. He's waiting for you to come back into relationship with him, and uh, all you have to do is is open your open your heart and bow the knee and let him in. All you have to do is is just you know pick up your cross and follow him. Died. Let you know. Let the let the old man be crucified, and then, and the new man be raised back to life uh, within you. And uh, you can have a whole new a whole new life. A whole no matter where you are, whether you're young, whether you're old, or somewhere in between. You know, t people keep sharing their testimonies with me of being brought back to to God after years of you know doing their own thing and, and 
trying to figure out figure it out on their own and just it continues to just blow me away and bless me and I just I thank you for all those that those stories that people continue to share we're gonna have to do some more flat earth testimonies I'm trying to kind of figure out how to maybe do a, another compilation or something like that but at the same time I feel like if I'm just reading them you know especially emails if I'm just I think maybe people just think I'm making it up or something but um, I don't know so thanks for watching and uh, talk to you guys later